Hey everybody, welcome to Wolf TV. I'm Zach White. Today we have something very entertaining, very interesting for you. A very exclusive tour here at the new Hunt Library. Okay, we're going to see some very cool stuff from Robert the Robot Institute for Emerging Issues. The latest in music recording technology. The latest in graphic design animation. The latest in 3D printing technology. From the outside to the inside, this place is incredible. So, so I think the thing that people will notice first when they come in the door to the Hunt Library down on the ground floor is the book bot. And what you're looking at here is what we call Robot Alley. Large, huge windows into the operation of the, of the book bot system. What, what the book bot bought us, I mean, we went back very early in the planning process. And like we always do, we talk to students and faculty and said, what do you need out of a library? And what they never told us they needed was row after row after floor after floor of bookshelves. You know, that's just not how people do their research these days. They still need the books. I mean, there are plenty of books that because of copyright law or because the ways publishers do their business, you know, you can only get in book form. But the majority, particularly the engineering faculty and textile faculty, is going to use the, you know, use online publications. So what we did was to take a huge amount of books, you're looking at a million and a half books here, and put them in a very small space and make them very easy to get at by using the latest technology. So what the BookBot does is if you go to a, uh, you go on your computer, you find the book you want, click on that book, within five minutes it's waiting for you upstairs. And what we have, what we buy by doing it that way is all the rest of the building that you're going to see in the next 30 minutes or so are group study rooms, plenty of places, to, you know, rooms filled with technology, all the things that students really do need out of a modern library. And our books are kind of tucked away in a place that, that makes them easy for us to get to. One of the things that people question when they hear about the book bot, other than it's robotic and uh, that in itself is both kind of cool and a little bit frightening to some people, is you know everybody who's been in a library knows what it's like to find a book in the in the catalog and go up and take a look at that book and discover that sitting next to it is the book you really wanted and didn't even know about. So people worry that they can't get at the books in the book bot. What we've done to that is a technological solution. What you're looking at here is the virtual browse system, which is also available on the web. And what it allows you to do is go in and type in the book that you're looking for, get that book, but then also see on a, on a virtual shelf, on an online shelf, all the books that would normally be stacked around that book if there were actual bookshelves. So it allows you in a virtual way to see what would be there. The great thing is that no book ever gets lost, no book's ever on somebody's uh, uh, desk someplace and you don't know about it, you can really see all the books NC State students have access to virtually online when you're doing your, doing your research for your papers. So we're now up on the second floor. This is the, the main entrance off the Oval. So a lot of the students who are here on Centennial Campus will be coming in this way. And what you'll actually come into when you come in from the second level is not actually part of the NCSU libraries. We, we share the space with the, uh, and I'll walk over here and show you, the Institute for Emerging Issues which is a think tank that is a resource for, for people in North Carolina who make decisions about economics, health, uh, education. This is the place that you'll come and do your primary research about that. It's also a place where they bring in decision makers around the state and let them explore these issues. And one of the things they wanted to make sure that they could do was to present this stuff, you know, as you'll see in the rest of the library, not as a bunch of old-fashioned books, but the latest state-of-the-art way to grab the information and to use that information. So it's a very interactive space, a very fun space to be in and a place that you're going to see. I mean, I come up here all the time and run into people that I see in the newspapers up here working through issues about, about the economy or health, their care issues, that sort of thing in the state. So we've just walked inside the library itself. One thing you'll notice are the turnstiles. Normally, they're wide open. This, this space is available to the, to the public through most of the, the day. At 10 o'clock at night, for security reasons, it becomes an NC State Wolfpack One card admission. The first thing you'll notice when you come in the library again is you're not seeing row after row after shelf after shelf of books. What the book bot allowed us to do was to open up all this space and use it for the stuff that, I, that NC State students really need and the work they do and NC State faculty need. You're, you're seeing the Apple Technology Showcase. It's called the Apple Technology Showcase because when we were developing the library, we wanted it to be like an Apple store. You know, th that's best in class for how you help people is the way Apple figured out 10 years ago how to do it. So as our sort of pet name, this became the Apple Technology Showcase. 
Ironically enough, the family that decided to pay for this space uh, was named Apple. So it is now the Apple Technology Showcase, named after Lawrence Apple, who was a longtime faculty member here, and, and his wife. What the Technology Showcase allows us to do is to put out for students to see when they come into the building all the things that are available for loans. So it's everything from a laptop to uh, a Raspberry Pi to you know, the late, latest GPS thing that the engineers, civil engineers would need to hear on, on campus. Uh, believe it or not, we loan out uh, 200,000 pieces of, uh, of technology a year out of the, the library. So this is a huge resource for students. The sort of thing that you, you know, may not be able to afford yourself, that you may not have with you at the time, come in and grab it, do your work with it, turn it back in and you know, go about your business of being great. Probably the signature of this building is the technology in it. One of the things that, that NC State students are famous for is you know, coming out of the door out of your senior year totally immersed in technology. When, when I was uh, in industry and hired people, NC State students, partly because I went to school here, but more because I knew that it was going to work, NC State students kind of went to the top of the pack. I knew that 25 years ago when they walked in the door, they were going to know how to use a computer already when most people didn't. I knew 15 years ago they were going to know how to use Word. Ten years ago they were going to know how to build a website. Five years ago they'd know how to do decent audio and, and video. What we're doing with the Hunt Library is providing the technology for students, the sort of technology that you probably could never afford to grab yourself, but make it available to you 24 hours a day to experiment with, to play with, to, to learn how to use. So what, what you're looking at behind you is the, the immersion theater. This is one of five uh, large-scale visualization walls inside the library. These things are four times more powerful than the most powerful flat screen TV you ever looked at. And as you can see, they're huge. This one's 21 feet long, uh, eight feet high. For students, this is a place where you can take your latest project and put it up there. If you're in the comms department, you've done a film that you're proud of, here's a place to show it off. We've just done one by a series of photographs by, uh, by a student from named Saul Flores that graduated last year who did a uh, five-month walk from Central America to Charlotte to sort of demonstrate what people who immigrate to the United States often have to do to, to get here. His family was from Mexico. It's also used by faculty who are studying large-scale visualization. So if you're studying, say, the, the interior of a cell and you want to talk to your students about how a cell works, you know, gathering around a piece of paper probably is not going to do it. Looking through a microscope is difficult. Here's a place where you can see it in, in a huge scale, in a beautiful scale. So the visualization laws, laws are a perfect example of something that probably no student in the United States can have access to except NC State students because you just couldn't afford it otherwise. It's that, that you know, really important cutting edge technology that we want to make available throughout the library for students. Behind me is the Rain Garden Reading Lounge, named for the Rain Garden, which is right outside the walls here. One of the things the architects tried to do, and I think did a pretty brilliant job of doing, is this is a building where you sort of the outside and the inside blend in. You'll see in the spring, you can't see it now, but the Rain Garden outside, which takes the water off the roof of the building so we don't pollute Lake Raleigh behind us has exactly the same colors in it that the, that the, uh, the carpet has here. So that sort of blending of the interior of the exterior building that gives you a sense of not being in a stuffy old library, but being in a place that you actually enjoy being in. You know, it may not be intuitive, but one of the reasons students love to come to the library is because they, li they like to be inspired in the spaces they're in. Uh, if you're sitting in, uh, in the middle of you know, 1890, stuffy, uh, moldy books, you're probably not going to do the best work in the world. This gives you a place that, that, that's inspiring and that's fun to be in. One of the things that students told us, one of the things that literature, people who study libraries tell us, is that students like to go to libraries because that what, what they always say is that you know, hard work is contagious, that not only is it fun to be around other students, but you can see people doing work around you, interesting work around you, and it somehow that feeds off itself and you get students doing better work as they can see other people doing the work around them. So it's a good safe place to be, you know, at one o'clock in the morning, but it's also a place that has a social atmosphere that the students really, really respond to well, I think.
So contrary to popular belief, there are actually books that you can walk up to and grab in the Hunt Library. You'll see behind me a collection of, uh, of uh, science fiction books. What we chose to do was to put out about 40,000 of the books that are sort of the classics in engineering, the classic, classics in textiles, the books that we know that people are looking for, or books that have been put out in the past couple of years. So the stuff that people are most likely to want to grab off the shelf, we put in open shelving, the rest is in the book box. So one of the things that we've not done well for students in the past is providing group study rooms. We know that students today aren't doing most of their work sitting by themselves in a corner someplace. That the, the projects they get in their classes are group projects a lot of the time. And you know it's really difficult to get one of those 16 group study rooms in DH Hill. So the Hunt Library has 100 of these group study rooms. And the frustrating thing is I still can't get one when I need to come in here and do some do some work. They're filled most of the time now. Just This is one of the most popular features of the building. As you can see, they're filled with technology, everything you need. The walls are all uh, whiteboards. You can write on the doors even. These things are set up so students can do the type of work that they, that they told us they need to do. We're in the main reading room of Hunt Library here, and what you'll notice is that there are some fairly traditional spaces here. You feel like you might be in a really nice uh, library from the 1950s or 60s here. It's a beautiful place to study, and it is a place where people who need to come and do uh, quiet work can find a, you know, a, a nice place to, to do their work and study. My name is Carl Perania. I'm a university library technician, and I'm the, the bookbot manager. So right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to store this book into the bookbot. This robot actually has a name. This is Robert the Robot. And there's a story behind that that's pretty interesting. Most of this building is paid for by the people of North Carolina. It was, the money was given to us by the General Assembly. It's been on the NC State radar for about 25 years. We've, uh, we've steadily gotten better libraries at NC State, but as we've gotten better libraries, we've also gotten more students coming into the libraries. And if you've been in DH Hill, you know what that's like. You know, With 10,000 students there at the end of a semester, it can be pretty difficult to find a decent place to, to, to study. One of the things that the UNC system asks universities to do is provide study seating for 20% of the students. Before the Hunt Library came online, we could provide student seating for about 4%. So we, we had a pretty big deficit. Hunt helps us cut down that deficit. Now we can seat about 10% of NC State students. 
the, the money we got from the General Assembly was generous. You can see the building as a beautiful building, but it wasn't enough. I mean, always what you see at the NCSU libraries that really makes them special comes from the additional money that we raise from people who love the university, who are love, you know, love NC State, love the NC State libraries. One of the things we did with Hunt was make naming opportunities available throughout the building for people who wanted to leave a legacy with the university. Uh, Robert the Robot is named for uh, Robert Bashford. Robert Bashford was a student here, an undergraduate student here who later went on and became both a medical doctor and a psychiatrist. And he's now the Dean of Admissions over at UNC uh, Medical School. My favorite story about Dr. Robert Bashford is that when he brings in new medical students to UNC, they're sitting there the first day, they're all nervous, you know, this is the start of their careers, you know, a lot is at stake, you know, it's the first year in medical school. So the first day of class he comes in and says, would anybody who went to NC State please stand up? And there'll be three or four people in the, in the beginning class who stand up. And then he'll say, I want everybody to take a look at these people because these are going to be the best students. <laughs> So as sort of a reward for that, a, a couple of his friends here at the university uh, paid for Robert the Robot in Robert Bashford's name. And throughout the, the spaces here in, the, in Hunt Library, you'll notice little plaques that say, you know, they give the names of people who donated substantial money for the technology and uh, let us enhance the building a little bit. So there's two different learning commons in the, in, the, in the Hunt Library. If you've been to DH Hill, you know the learning commons are sort of the center of both student life and uh, and, and learning that goes on there. What we've tried to do with this learning commons on the third floor is provide a whole lot of open space, a whole lot of different type of furniture, all of which can be moved around, all the technology a student would need, just a place when you need to come and grab a bunch of people and work together. This is it, and great views, except it's a rainy, ugly day, so they're not all that good today. We talked about earlier with the five large-scale visualization walls in the library, which have a pretty serious purpose. I mean, one to display student and faculty work, another to do research in large-scale visualization. I'll show you some really cool stuff on the, on the next floor, but this is a, an exclusive breaking news for Wolf TV. You'll see here what is obviously not a large-scale visualization wall, but soon will be. So there will be another huge wall the size of this wall here. Again, used for serious purposes to you know, display student work, to display faculty work, to, to do research, but also starting, we hope this year, to show the NCAA conference games here. So this thing is really controlled space, sound space, really nice place to sit. We want to start a tradition of bringing students, to give, giving students a good place to watch the, watch the basketball games. So we're up on the fourth floor now, and this is what we call the R&D floor. This is the floor in Hunt Library that's really chocked full of some of the coolest technologies you can find on campus. Again, available for students 24 hours a day. Uh, also one of the best views on campus, I think, down into the Rain Garden uh, Reading Lounge. <clears throat> this is a pretty good uh, example of a couple of things that go on at Hunt. First of all, notice that it's, total, it's called the fishbowl, and it's the fishbowl because you can literally see what's going on inside of it. Right now, I'm not sure what exactly is happening here, but I'm interested, and that's the point. I walk by, I see some people are doing some interesting stuff in here. I stop and maybe learn a little something, maybe get a little bit inspired. So that, again, that sense that when you're in the building that you can see everything that's going on around you and get a sense of the you know, variety of things that NC State students are doing. We're up on the fourth floor, we're up on the, what we call the R&D floor, and behind you you'll see two different rooms. One is the teaching and visualization lab, the other is the creativity lab. What's interesting about these rooms is that it's uh, a place where you can actually go and do pretty much 3D simulations. So in this room over here, the first project that we're working on is from an English a professor here at the university who said finally after 40 years in teaching, the technology has caught up with his ambition. And his ambition is to show you what it would be like to hear a 17th century sermon. 
Uh, on the surface of it, that may seem dull, but remember what's going on in 17th century England. People are fighting to the death, cutting each other's heads off over the things that they're hearing on church on Sunday. So being able to experience what one of those sermons were like is a, is a real educational you know, treat, actually. It's a chance to, to take things away from a book and into real life. So in a couple of months, you'll be able to walk in the teaching visualization lab and be able to know exactly what it felt like to be uh, when John Dunn was doing a sermon, say, in 1660 in front of 5,000 people in an open space. These rooms can create an, an amazingly accurate livable simulation. Some of the students that I've taken through you know, immediately start calling it the holodeck and it's it's not but it's close and it's a very exciting place to, to be able to, to use. Then you can walk 40 feet down the, 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 the hall here to the creativity lab. The first big project we're doing in there will be with the Navy ROTC and you'll be able to go in there and be on the bridge of a naval ship. So this will be part of the training program at NC State where you can actually, in a 3D sort of way, feel, operate a ship in a way that you know, you're not going to be able to get if you're at any other university in the United States. So uh, this is the makerspace at NCSU Libraries. We have three 3D printers, uh, two MakerBots, which are the consumer level printers, very accessible, inexpensive to print on, uh, very cheap for students to create prototypes. We have a higher level U-print printer. Uh, so this is a basically a pro model printer that students have access to. Uh, they can print all sorts of things. These are kind of some examples of, of things that have been printed on the 3D printers. Students come in here with their prototypes, especially for their senior design projects. They are always printing out gears and boxes and different things that they're using to create objects uh, for their engineering classes. People are also building fun things. That's why there's things like birds and squirrels and tops. Um, but it's been really exciting. I, I think the most exciting thing about this space is seeing uh, the people come in not knowing a single thing about 3D printing and then leaving here uh, with an idea, coming back with their object to print, uh, and then uh, being very satisfied with how quickly they can create something that's just an idea one day and it's a real object the next day. So it's pretty awesome. Um, we also have a laser cutter which can cut wood, cut cardboard. Uh, it can etch material, so you can take a piece of metal and etch in it. 3D printing exists, but what the libraries provide is access to tools that they wouldn't necessarily have access to. Um, or there are lots of barriers to access for those tools. So just like the library lends out books that are expensive, just like the library buys databases that are expensive, um, we give access to tools that students wouldn't necessarily have access to otherwise. I think the makerspace is a great example of how this library contributes, is hoping to contribute to the economic life and to the research life that goes on at NC State that is one of the big drivers of the economy of this state. My favorite project was a couple of guys who wandered in the second day we were open, or just kind of looking around at the library. Uh, pretty excited the way most of us were, didn't even know about the bank makerspace, walked in, turned out there were two guys doing research on how people who have visual impairments can get around in a city environment. And one of their ideas is instead of having you know, a braille thing that explains an intersection, to have an actual tactile representation of what that intersection would look like. So another, sort of working on our, our topic that we've talked about a lot and we've gone through this building of making stuff that's, making technology that may be very expensive, very hard for most people to get access to. Several places in the building we have video conferencing suites. This suite was, uh, it was given to us by Cisco, as a matter of fact, it's one of their top of the line video conferencing suites. So a faculty member who's working for somebody in Sweden or Thailand or uh, China can come here to this room and have, you know, first class video conferencing experience, save a ton of, of travel money, have instantaneous communication around the globe. One of the things the libraries has long wanted to do and hasn't been able to do is provide a place for graduate students. You know, libraries don't come around and tell you to be quiet because we understand how important it is that, that you be able to collaborate. Graduate students are slightly different animals. They do need the quiet. They do need the focus. So we're finally able to give them a dedicated spot here and a really nice dedicated spot with group study rooms with the technology that they need. 
what we're hoping will happen here, and we've already seen some evidence that it is, is that not only do you find a, a place to sort of get away from the hubbub of an undergraduate library, but the person sitting next to you may be in a totally different field than you're in, and you start a conversation, and it's that conversation across disciplines that we're hoping will happen a lot in this building. I'll show you some other spaces that encourage that. One of the things that NC State is becoming known for is not doing silos. I'm just a biologist. I'm just a designer. Instead, you know, what happens when you put a really good d graphics designer in with a computer science person? What can you do with video games when you get those two people working together? So here's some of our best and brightest, some of the, you know, the brightest people on campus, the graduate students who have the place of their own, but also have a place where they can, where they can collaborate with each other and meet each other across disciplines. Some of the technologies in the libraries are incredibly expensive, are things that students and faculty couldn't afford to, to get on their own. Some of them are pretty pedestrian, but nevertheless pretty revolutionary. It's hard at DH Hill to find a place to stick your stuff if you need to go, you know, spend 15 minutes away from it. So lockers, easy to check out. A place to put your stuff is you're, you're, you're taking some time off. And we had to fight everybody in the world for this, but they finally allowed it. There are actually plugs in here so you could plug in your laptop and, and crank it up as you're going to get some coffee. So, so one of the things I talked about earlier is that when I worked for industry, I wanted to hire NC State students because I knew they were going to come in the door immersed in the technology. Not only would they know it, but they were likely to be able to teach the people I'd been working with for 10 years and had sort of gotten stale on it. This is what what you're looking at here are six rooms that we have uh, on the fourth floor of Hunt that are that are chuck full of, of digital media technology. These are actually set up for audio recording. We've got two around the corner that are set up for video recording. Again, expensive stuff that most students couldn't afford to put their hands on every day. Now NC State students can come in here 24 hours a day and learn how to use this stuff. And when they leave NC State, they have those skills in ways that students at other universities just aren't going to be able to afford to have. So this is probably not the nicest day for it, but I think this is probably soon going to be one of the most popular places on campus. If you've been in this building for 10 hours, you're exhausted. Stepping outside and looking at Lake Raleigh is pretty inspirational. It's also got to be the best, uh, best place for a sunset on the NC State campus at this point. Such a good view. As a matter of fact, I've already got one uh, TV station here who wants to set up and do the uh, Raleigh fireworks next year from the from the Skyline Terrace here. The Hunt Library is designed to be a lead silver building. Some of the things that, that I haven't pointed out but probably should have is that there are roof gardens all around the building. And what this does is allow the uh, the rainwater that comes on top of the building that would normally gather all the stuff that's in the air and drain it into Lake Raleigh. Instead, it's going to be filtered through the, through the, the roof gardens. The, uh, the building also has an incredible heating and air conditioning system that uh, instead of blowing air around with a lot of electricity, uses radiant uh, uh, heating and cooling. It's probably going to save or is designed to save $1.2 million over the next decade on just the heating and air conditioning cost in this building alone. So where I'm standing in right now is the game lab here at Hunt Library on Centennial Campus. This is a really exciting space uh, for students to come in and play games. It's a fun space. It's also a serious space. Faculty bring in their classes into this space so that we can uh, interact with large data sets and you know, perform kind of uh, different interesting visual explorations through these, this large display behind me. So, uh, what am I looking at? Uh, what are you looking at? This is uh, a fully interactive touch panel that's about 20 feet long and uh, about five, six feet high. And it's made of small kind of micro tiles. So uh, this is going to be opening in, I think, uh, early to mid-March is the plan right now. And it will certainly be opening by the grand opening on April 3rd, which I encourage all the students to come out to. It's going to be a lot of fun. You're going to get a lot of hands-on experience, kind of checking out the spaces here at Hunt. It's going to be a really exciting time. And you can actually come in and play with what you're seeing behind me. Uh, so uh, what you're looking at right now is a space, space visualization. And uh, you know, all the different colleges across campus are putting their own content onto this. So you know, from, from veterinary science to mathematics to you know, humanities, uh, lots of different content is going to be up on this wall. So um, 
one of the main use cases that I think most of the student body will be interested in is the gaming aspect of things. So you can see down here, um, we've got uh, several different uh, game consoles. And we're going to be able to put this up as one large display, or you can chop it in half, or you can put it in thirds or quads. And so you know, this is going to allow for lots of different uh, kind of games to be played. And that's a fun experience, but that's also a serious experience because you know, um, a lot of people here make games. A lot of the students actually make games. And so seeing what else is out there is really a great way to learn about kind of where the state of the art is. And it's pretty fun, too. So as if this isn't cool enough, this is actually a fully interactive touch wall. So um, here you can see that we can actually explore the solar system. Um, with this kind of pinch and zoom style, and we can also rotate this. And this is a really rich model, because as I begin to zoom out here, you can see this uh, solar system here. And one of my favorite views is actually just outside of our solar system, which is here. It's kind of a look at um, the things that are right around us, some of our nearest neighbors here. One of the things I like about this model is that you can kind of see this wave emanating from the sun, just that right there. Um, that's pretty cool. That's actually light that is scaled properly to account for the space distance between these stars. And so this represents the, uh, the speed of light as it moves through space emanating from our sun. So um, this space, if you guys have been over to DH Hill, this space is going to be similar in, uh, to the, the kind of gaming experience that you get over here. Um, although, it, unlike DH Hill, which is kind of an always open environment, I want to show you one other cool thing about this space. Um, if you look, look out through this window right here, and if you wouldn't mind flipping that switch, the leftmost one on the back wall. So as you look out through this window, notice that it's going to turn opaque. It's going to turn completely solid. And as on the back wall, and kind of rotate around the room, you can see that these are turning solid here. So we've got a few more panels to install here, but when we're done, this whole place is going to become totally sealed off. So that allows us to kind of have more of a private, intimate experience uh, or play games that you know, might not be finished or experimental or kind of review data sets that might be confidential. Uh, so you know, those are the kinds of things that we can do here that are unique to Hunt that we couldn't do in D.H. Hill. What are we looking at here? This is something that we're very proud of. Uh, this is actually a game that was built by NC State students, undergrads who are part of the computer science program, but also undergrads who are part of the College of Design. And we pair them together uh, and allow them to work collaboratively to conceive and build and design and implement and test a game that they literally created from scratch. And so let's go ahead and check this, this game out. The title of this game is called Knoll. And Right now, it's being played from a keyboard format. But when it's in its final form, it will be able to be played from a connect, actually. And so you've got to imagine that there's going to be, there, and there are connects um, uh, up here above the screen. And you'll be able to stand in front of it and kind of interact with it kind of like this. So um, what we have hooked up right now today is this keyboard interface. And we also have an Xbox controller in the back. And what this game is about is um, kind of you're chasing this bandit who's escaped with some, uh, some things that you need to catch. And you're trying to jump over and avoid these different areas. So uh, this is pretty exciting because it was built in pretty short order. I think it was built in maybe three to four months. So that's exactly one semester from kind of design and concept all the way through to implementation. And uh, this, was, this is one example of many games that have been put together. And I'd love to show you all of them. And you can see all of them if you come by Hunt and check them all out. I'm Molly Renda, and I'm the Exhibits Program Director here at NCSU Libraries. So I do physical exhibits as well as digital exhibits. What we're looking at right now is um, more of an ambient piece of artwork that uh, Brent Bradford on our communications staff has developed with a 3D program called Maya, and um, I w the question was posed, I believe, why would a graphic design student have uh, interest in having a facility like this on campus to work with? And it's kind of like having a theater program 
with a real theater. So material that you're working on on a very small scale, um, if your plan is to enter the workforce and work for um, large scale um, experience um, uh, digital media, then this is a excellent canvas to um, test out those materials. And so it's kind of a no-brainer that a graphic design student would, would find myriad ways of, of working through um, either narrative content, abstract content, uh, experience, uh, user experience, material, testing things, but to have a university where we have engineers and uh, artists and policy makers all working on, our, on these various outposts of colleges, imagine how a design department could uh, amplify, influence, and uh, make clearer the kinds of investigations that are going on in, in engineering or veterinary medicine. So bringing those people together who are doing visualizations of various kinds and having them articulated even in a more clear fashion with the expertise of what the graphic design or uh, experienced design artist students are doing in the college. So I think if you boiled down the Hunt Library, what the university is trying to accomplish, what the General Assembly was trying to accomplish when they funded this, what the people who have given money to, the, to, to, the, to make this dream come true are trying to accomplish, is this is the, the face of NC State in this century. When people walk into this library, they get a sense of what NC State is all about, what we're expecting from our students, the kind of work that we, that, that we expect from our faculty. This is a place that's going to be world renowned as the sort of leading edge for how people do learning and research in the 21st century. I hope you guys all enjoyed the exclusive tour here at the Hunt Library. This place is absolutely incredible from the inside out. Thank you. The game knows how to bring together the level, and so once it, it figures out a design that it wants to implement, uh, the game starts to fly in the appropriate tiles from the right sides. And it's us using an area of game development called procedural level generation to kind of use a series of rules to generate levels that are interesting and of varying difficulty. And that's actually one of the other aspects of this is the level difficulty gets more difficult the higher you perform. And that's one of the great parts about procedural level generation is that you can tailor the game experience to the maturity level of the player. And so as players get better, the environments get more difficult. And it's actually, when, when you build the machinery to do it, it actually gets a lot easier than trying to build a variety of levels, a variety of difficulties, and quickly move them, the user in between them. So it, it's, uh, it's a slightly more complicated strategy, but it actually um, becomes easier in the end to create a really engaging gameplay experience. So you can see in the background, the level's kind of flying itself in. You know, this is, this is really for the students and for the faculty. And, you know, it doesn't hurt that Hunt's a 24-hour facility for six days of the week. So, you know, people can come here and kind of go crazy. I'm chasing you. I'm chasing you. I how to jump. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Once we figure out how to jump. Here, there's a, there's a really breathtaking scene coming up. Let's okay. just get there. Ooh, Watch this. This is, this is amazing. So in the distance there, that's, that's, generating that and it's choosing to generate it wow it's choosing to generate a straight one because we haven't demonstrated um, the ability to jump the, the ability to to <laughs> do some certain things 
the ability to achieve. Oh. And you see, he's the bandit is actually modeling some pretty good behavior for us. He's kind of jumping and. He's trying to tell us to jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, well, and so, so you can see it's kind of starting to get curved a little bit. So now it's, it, it recognizes that we can go back and forth. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly the why, why this works this way. That is awesome.